This is uh, okay. This is the second part of the interview with Mr. Dave Mercier. Um, so where we left off was um, you, we were talking about. Oh, I remember. I was trying to push you the Modern Plats to uh, Donna Jackson, and this is around 1987. Uh, she's part of J Jackson Entertainment in Cape Cod area. I'm not sure it's around anymore. And at that time. The the, uh, the Modern Platt sound was a nice jangled pop, college pop sound, and at that time, late '80s, there was the hair bands coming out of the, I think the out of uh, California, LA, and then uh, right. there was might have, there might have been other other um, new aspects of music and new wave seemed to be kind of dissipating a little bit and I think that's why she didn't want to push you guys I think she was looking for something else sponsored by coffee <laughs> so the well, I, that kind of leads me into the next thing which is um, the music scene ch maybe changing a little bit and then kind of where the modern plants were and kind of what kind of led you to go to Los Angeles? Um, well, I, I, we could have, I mean, I was all in. I mean, we were like in our young mid-20s, and I mean, I was just, I wanted to, even though we all graduated from college, I, I wanted to go for it. And, you know, you get to that point where you have to just, you have to put, you have to just go for it or get another, or get a job and be a cover band or do it part-time. But nobody in this, nobody that's really successful just goes, oh, I'm just going to kind of tweak at it and see what happens. So I, I was just gung ho, and the, and yeah, maybe I was a, maybe a little more ambitious or something. But I, I know we could have gotten signed by an independent label. I mean, you know, we just we just weren't we didn't we weren't organized enough. We started doing some recording, you know, little eight track stuff, but nothing professional. And you did I have originals to, too. You yeah. started doing originals. Yeah, we did. We, yeah, and you know that, that's that's the point. The rhythm guitarist was a great songwriter. I mean, you know, Gerard could write songs, and that was still you know for that era. It was they were, I loved the song. And then I wrote, you know, so you had two writers, you know, and then everybody sang. So the harmonies were a really big part of that band. And I mean, I just went like you know, I just. We, I thought we had the talent to get signed, but they didn't want to take it to the next level. And I didn't want to just, you know, keep playing covers um, and some originals. And I, you know, I, I needed, I wanted to hear them say, yeah, let's go for it, but they, they just didn't want to do it. So I, I thought I'll, I'll head out to LA, see what I can do out there. Now you, you wanted to go to LA even possibly for college. So like myself, you had kind of a California bug in you also, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, I just, yeah, I, I feel like at the time I felt like, yeah, I should have been born in LA maybe, you know. I thought if our band was from UCLA instead of UMass, maybe we would have gotten more attention. Um, I don't know, I just, I, yeah, I just, I kind of, I love the I loved the warm weather. I loved everything about the LA thing at the, at the time. So it just made sense to come out. I was trying acting at the time too. Um, so, you know, but, but um, it's a whole different scene. I mean, it, you, it was funny. I mean, you know, you were a part of it too because you came out shortly after me and you knew that I thought it was the place to be. It was the place to be in the early 80s and uh, the late, late 70s. I mean, all my favorite bands that were signed by IRS Records at the time you know, I mean, a lot of them played through L.A. I mean, like the Bangles and the Go-Go's, um, which were a little before us, but still, you had R.E.M., the Bangles, the Go-Go's, the Stray Cats. Um, gosh, just a bunch of a bunch that were on that same label. I believe they were all on that same label. But uh, that type of music, and so Madame Wong was the big deal, and, and these really, really great places to play and get exposure. But by the time we came out in the late 80s, it was all hair bands. <laughs> yeah, I remember I worked at the Portofino Inn, and, yeah. and the uh, this is in Hermosa, in Redondo, Redondo right. Beach. Yeah, and then uh, the yachts out there, people were naming like Cinderella, Motley Crue, having yachts, and the you know, 
It was, yeah. I mean, it, it, at this time, all the all the great music coming out of Seattle and Atlanta and other other cities, because grunge was starting, you know. And, and uh, so LA was. I mean, if you were if you were a metal band, it was the place to be. If you weren't a metal band, I don't know. It wasn't that great. I mean, it wasn't what we thought it was. I I had fantasies of the canyon scene, you know, the Laurel Canyon scene from the '60s and '70s. And that was way over. By then, it was like five five billion dollars to even rent a house in Laurel Canyon. Never mind, you know, live up there or buy something. So it, it, yeah, so uh, I loved Hermosa. And it, it was the throwback to the '60s in the South Bay of LA, and that whole scene. And I I started just playing acoustic because I'd go to open mics and I could sing. And so they'd like, you want to play? So I played at you know all the Hennessys and Toppers, and I played like you know, uh, Second Street Promenade. So I had like four or five different gigs. And mostly, Shack. mostly covers, but you throw in originals or just mostly covers? Uh, I would throw in originals every now and then. I was still writing at the time. I just didn't, I didn't know a lot about tech and recording. And back then they didn't have stuff like they have today with the DAW and, you know, and, and you cut amazing records from your living room. Back then, I mean, I remember I, I was just not tech minded and you remember I bought a drum machine, which I just gave to you because I couldn't figure it out at the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was it was, you know, and then and then I was put I put my I was trying to find the band I had back in Massachusetts. So we put ads out in BAM and the Music Connection and Music Contact Service, all these all these places. And you and I would go out and we would check out these people. And, you know, I was like, well, let's see, I sing better than them, I write better than them. And all he wanted me to do is play bass. But in fairness, I advertised myself that way. I didn't say, I, I, I wasn't putting myself as a singer songwriter looking for a band. I advertised as a bass player that sang. And I put my influences like R.E.M., the Smithereens, the, you know, stuff like that, the Beatles. And we got the call from Terry Nunn that one time, which is really funny, as you, you thought it was a hoax. Uh, but I mean, a little yeah. caveat, people don't know that. Um... I wanted to meet. I'm not into Hollywood drama stuff. The one person I wanted to meet because I saw her in a video was Terry Nunn, and at that time I was in a skinny puppy. But uh, uh, Terry Nunn from Berlin, and then Dave, solo. Right? Dave gets a call from Terry Nunn. <laughs> Did she actually call? What 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 amazing that she would interview her you know future band members because obviously she's rep by a management. And you think they would, but that, I thought that was cool. You, and then you, and then you answer the phone. You know, everybody thought, yeah. I think John, I think our friend answered the phone, and he said, "Yeah, I'm John Lennon." You know, <laughs> everybody was, you know, Terry was just it was it was sweet that she actually reached out, and wanted to know who her band members were. Um, and and I wasn't, uh... you know, I, I was not again, I wasn't a pro bassist and everything. I I, I didn't really have a demo package. I remember I was still very aggressive and, and ambitious, and I, I actually drove to the, the management company, and I was like, "Here's my here's my demo." <laughs> They're like, as you know, at the time we were just knocking on all these publishing doors and record companies, and and you had to you had to have representation, and they would just they we you know this is not the '60s and '70s where every single great band seemed to know each other, you know, from the the Jackson Brown and Eagles and Linda Ronstadt days where. It was like, yeah, uh, Jackson Brown lived upstairs, and Glenn Fry lived up next door over, and and you know I was dating Linda Ronstadt, who dated Bon, who who, you know, had a friend that was dating Bonnie Raitt, and you know you hear, you hear those stories about um, even before then, where it was just a small world in Laurel Canyon with uh, you know with the guys from Crosby, Stills and Nash and the Joni Mitchell scene. It wasn't like that. It was not like that at all when we were there in the late '80s. It was, or the early '90s. It was hard to get noticed anywhere, you know. And then, and then, you could play these places in Hollywood, like 8121, uh, which were, you know, these clubs that were around Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood, or Genghis Cohen and Cafe Largo. But yeah, it was just you had to bring your own fans and people. There were probably better places to get your music heard in Boston, you know, or <laughs> Manchester, New Hampshire. So yeah, it was, it was kind of a, it was, it wasn't the scene, at least for our type of music or for what I was trying to do. 
And you know, and then I, and then if you don't have money for a decent demo and you don't know a lot about, well, you could, like I said, I didn't know nothing about tech. I didn't have my own recording studio, and I wasn't as focused on how to get things out uh, at the time. Yeah, you mentioned about the first time I ever saw like a mini home studio was in LA when um, you went to meet E. Oh, right, from the Heels. Yeah, um, that was our, I guess that was our small world moment. I mean, you know, cause he, he, he was, but he was, he was the same age as us, but he was very organized and very focused. Probably had some money backing of some sort. Um, I don't know, uh, came from probably more money than we did. <laughs> And, um, and he, you know, and I remember, he, you know, I was like, yeah, I write too. And I sing too. Can I play my stuff? And he's like, no, no. And he's like, I'm just looking for a bass player. And he, he was kind of abrupt about it. And I was like, all right, you know, and he, and he played his demos. And I was like, and again, I'm not, I'm not bragging on myself. I just thought I, I sang and wrote maybe a little bit better, but again, it just depends on what kind of music you like. I mean, his music was probably pretty progressive at the time and he was focused and, and organized and got signed by, I think, Polygram and, you know, he was all over the place uh, back then. So, yeah, I just wanted to get in a band where I could feel the chemistry again and just have, and be having fun. And I, I just, I never found that. There were people that were either re really talented and not connected or very connected and just not really talented. But I just never found uh, any kind of chemistry with band members um, out here, you know, back then. So then um, fast forward to later on in the years, you, you decided I'm going to go at it solo and start writing music. Um, the um, did you did you travel anywhere um, and what's your experience been like? Uh, trying to do the solo thing and then trying to well i played I, pl I played all over the place in the you know till around the early 90s and then i just got you know and when i say play all over the place just solo acoustic really and, and after a while it just wasn't becoming as you know didn't feel as rewarding and and i just kind of you know stopped for a long time and uh, really, um, I mean, I still wrote because, you know, when, when you write, you just naturally write. And But I didn't write as much. And it didn't all start, like, blossoming again. And excuse me, it's not an earthquake. I'm clicky, clicking my, <laughs> my desk. Um, in 2015, I, I just started writing like crazy. And I wrote more than I'd ever written in the years previous. So uh, gone are the three demo cassettes. Oh, three song demos for cassettes oh. or other things and then now we're entering into a new technology if you will you mentioned da is there a, how to, how did you kind of make your way through you you, pro, you went to nashville you maybe you did other well, things and, and maybe yeah. take people through so the I, process I, I, got, I ended up selling real estate and so i had a few bucks saved um, and I, and I really, really wanted, I have su such a backlog of songs that I just really, really wanted to put them out. So I did, again, I didn't, I'm, I'm not tech, I'm not a tech guy and I'm, and, and definitely wasn't into social media at the time. And I, I, put, I, you know, it was a gradual experience. First of all, I, you know, through, Again, I call them kind of God shots in life where you just, you know, I, I was knocking on record company, not record company, recording studios in Burbank who were, who were recording like Britney Spears and stuff. And they're like, are you are you a sales rep from Verizon? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I, I, can I, is it possible to record here? Or, you know, I get some money and they're like, <laughs> slam the door on me. And I, cause I, so I, I again, I just, I, I didn't know what the process was. Obviously I'd go online and I, and I, and I, and, and then, you know, I, I had a connection that I kind of knew all along and I ran into him again. And I'm actually, this is a guy, well, the first guy I ran into was this guy, Thomas Barquet, who was a musician here. And he's a, does a, he, was a, he was from Germany and did, did a lot of big things um, in the late 80s, and early 90s, touring for some big artists. And he's a producer here now, a lot for new age music. And, and he goes, come on over and I'll help you out. And he's, he's our age. And I, 
started doing some demos with him, but he's so busy and, and he's pretty expensive. And I and I, I I'm a real, as you know, John. I'm a very I have OCD and I'm very hands-on. And 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 I I would do some stuff and then he would put it together and send it to me and I was like, no, oh, that's not what I like. And then I met another guy again through you know this is just kind of like. I call them God shots where you just, run, you know, you keep you keep trying to make the process going, you keep knocking on doors and trying to find the chemistry of somebody to record with that has really good tech and engineering uh, experience. And I met another guy and I went over to his place again. And again, it was like I, I laid some tracks and then he did some mixing and I wasn't happy. But I met with him again and this time I, I stayed with him for three, four hours and went over everything with him. And that's when things started to work. And his name is uh, Sebastian Palmer, and, and he's really brilliant engineer and and, uh, and producer. And I had, you know, and, and I knew we were doing some really good work. And I was really excited because I'm like, finally, you know, kind of putting stuff together. And then it was, you drop it on Spotify and you do your thing. And then you're like, okay, how is anybody gonna know about this unless you have a marketing plan? Yeah. So I spent the, I dropped two songs and I, and I stopped releasing stuff because I'm like, I got to learn how to market these things. And that took, again, you know, we're older musicians and singer songwriters trying to learn social media is not easy. It's just, it is where it is though. You have to learn TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and, and Facebook reels and all that stuff, mostly TikTok and Instagram. And that's where you're going to really build the fans organically. But it's not, it's not even just there because you have to, you know, if you're gonna do some recording, you gotta get, is you gonna use your iPhone? What kind of lighting are you gonna get? What external mics are you gonna use? You know, when you're, when you're releasing stuff independently, you have to be your own record company. Yeah, so and so it's... you've gotta do 5,000 things. And as anybody who's trying to do this independently knows, it takes a lot of time and then you've gotta learn a lot. It's a lot of YouTube testimonial videos you know so things have changed a little bit from the submitting a, a demo getting heard on a radio or by an a rep and then uh, right. uh, picked up by yes. a label now is a lot of do-it-yourself stuff and uh, mm -hmm. processes uh, self-educating process and uh, trying to uh, find people to help you along the way uh, where are you at now, and uh, are you going to release anything uh, soon uh, by yeah. way of EP? Finally, finally, I'm really slow at stuff, but I'm going to start releasing songs every three, three to four weeks. I've got, I've got the like five already set up and ready to go. I've got sort of a pre-release and post-release campaign set up that I'm going to do uh, because you know. You know, people who write songs, if you love your songs, you really got to do your homework because you want to get them, sorry about that, you want to get them so that they're going to be marketed as well as possible. And, and you really have to educate yourself. And there are, the record companies just don't work like they used to do in the old days. They're going to want to see you getting Spotify, uh, a Spotify, you know, followers and streams and organically on your social media. Are a lot of people following you. It's not like the old days where they would just pop a lot of money for you know a demo deal or sign you and throw a lot of money at you. They're not going to do that unless you've got some sort of traction going organically. And um, so you know, it, so then it takes money too. But uh, um, before we go, is there anything um, uh, when I look at you and, and what you did in LA, you kind of have a singer songwriter kind of. Uh, aspect to you in terms of genre and you but you're also getting into um band oriented stuff with uh production etc do you have any advice that you can give to other people who are trying to um maybe get started i mean we're we're kind of latecomers you know you've you've had experience playing out and um you've been you had the band experience you've had some of the solo singer songwriter experience now songwriting Anything experiential you want to share with someone who's maybe interested in doing music or, you know? Yeah, I mean, be authentic. Um, you know, be authentic as you can if you're a singer, a songwriter, 
um, if, you, if you've got arrangement ideas in your head, you know, don't just ship it off to somebody. If you can afford it, really try to get your vision because I have songs that just, I have the whole thing playing in my head. For me, I, I need to be with the producer, uh, you know, so I can, you know, he can throw some stuff at me. I can listen and go, yeah, this is what I like. Because you want your final product, you know, I mean, your your songs are your babies and you want your final product to be something that you're really proud of. I mean, nothing's going to be 100%. You know, we have the 80%, above 80% ratio where I'm really happy with it. And if you can find that engineer producer guy, then you're on your way and try to set a budget up because you're going to need, you know, you might want to run Spotify conversion ads and Facebook or Google ads or YouTube ads or something to promote it. And just really know how to know you'll get to know your way around social media because it's going to be the best organic source. You know, we've talked about this before. There's a lot of botted companies out there that'll, you know, if they say that they're going to get you a certain amount of streams for this amount of money, most likely they're, they're bots, which is really not going to get you a true audience. If you really, really want to get a fan base, which is really what I set out to do. I mean, you know, if I start playing out again live, I want I want to get even if it's 30 people, I want 30 people that like we love you know we really love your songs. We want to hear you. Are you coming to Nashville? Are you gonna Are you playing out in LA? That's where the, that's where the real joy is uh, for me. I mean, and again, I, I, I took so long to get going on it, but I do have a clear plan now. So be you know be authentic, you know because uh, and then just. And then get it out there. You know, a lot of times, like myself, I, I'll overthink things. But post as much as you possibly can on social media. Um, you, yeah, try to make the quality as good, but you can learn along the way. How about, um, how about connecting um, the lyrics in your songs uh, and connecting with people, your audience? Well, I think that's going to happen organically. So the more stuff you can start putting out on these social media things, anytime somebody comments or DMs you, respond back. Even if you're starting with one or two people and and, and then grow it from there. But it, it just seems like you're, you know, the algorithms really pick up consistency. And so I'm, I'm, I'm at that point, you know, cause I, again, I, I needed to learn a lot of stuff as far as, you know, this video, video editing, et cetera. But, I, but you know, once you get it down, there's 5,000 different content ideas. You know, it doesn't have to be what you see on TikTok. Whatever you whatever, find, something that you love. Like I love songwriting, so it, talk about that when you're on TikTok or Instagram. Hey, I wrote this song called like my song. I'm gonna release Storo Drive. It's a song about living in Boston and you know my youth. And you know, um, and then just tell the story. How did you write it? You know, like I'm gonna make YouTube videos and TikTok videos and say I was playing a Beatles song, All My Loving, and the chord change on the chorus that goes, oh, my loving, I will send to you. I just used that structure and I I kind of made it go melodically and follow a baseline route. And I came up with a completely different song, you know? Um, I love hearing those kind of stories. I love songwriting videos and, and things on YouTube. So, I mean, if that's what you love, make that a part of your social media plan and and then just get it out. Well, thank you very much for spending time with uh, me do, uh, in the audience. Uh, I hope they glean uh, a lot of information from this interview in terms of your experience going through the music scene and and then up to current and how you you know how you have to deal with you know do-it-yourself stuff. And uh, thank you very much.